If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode this of special Mind, episode. M- 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 Mind Pump. We uh, cranked up the estrogen today. Yeah, yeah. it was a special guest, Christina. How you doing, Christina? It's better looking in here, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. We're so, taking a page out of the rappers where you just have like features on your album. Like that's we're, I, we're yeah. featuring Christina Rice. That's right. X-Tina. Check out this yeah. track. Yeah. So <laughs> for the first half of the episode, we do our normal bullshitting chit chat conversation. We talk about which uh, Christina appreciates finally. She yeah. loves that. Yeah. We talked about Organifi green juice. Maybe the worst commercial we've done yet for fertility. For the best. We're going for, downhill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, fast, apparently yeah. changes. Vote how, with your dollars, please. Adam says yes. it changes how it tastes. That's oh, awesome. Oh. He loves it. We talk about U2's concert technology. Epic. Adam's blown away by how awesome their concerts are. We talk about FKJ and Masego. I have no idea what I'm talking what about right now. What does that mean? That's the, <laughs> that's the music that uh, Adam introduced us oh, to. Oh, right. Then we talk about StubHub and disrupting technologies. And then we go off yeah. and talk about the value, quote unquote, of higher education. Wow. Uh, also, Some people will get angry, probably. Of course, I did mention Organifi. We are sponsored by them. If you go to OrganifiShop.com, enter the code MINDPUMP, you'll get a discount on the best organic supplements you can find online. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, if you can't separate cardio and weight training, in other words, if you have to do them all in one workout, which one should you do first? There is a right answer. The next question was, is it a good investment to get a weightlifting belt? In other words, if I'm working out with weights, should I get a weight belt or should I work out uh, without anything at all? Like Justin, he works out naked. Yeah, that's the, the way to do it. The next question was, this individual feels hungry all the time. Even after they feel a full, eat a full meal, they're still hungry. What the hell is going on? How can they fix that so they don't constantly overeat? And finally, this is the uh, most important question of the episode. Mm. How do you tell your girlfriend she's fat without being an asshole? (laughs) We give great advice. Very delicate. In this part of the episode. Not at all. Also, this month, you can get two things for free. Two, not one, but two. That's uh, twice as much as one. Now that you know the math, we have the intuitive nutrition guide and the fasting guide, both nutrition components available for free if you enroll in any maps bundle now bundles are where we combine multiple maps programs together and discount them like 20 or 30 percent off Uh, for example our maps super bundle gives you a year one full year that's 12 months 365 days of exercise programming expert exercise programming but we have other bundles where we combine two programs together or three programs together for specific goals for example we have a build your butt bundle we have a sexy athlete bundle Um, and then of course the maps super bundle Enroll in any of those bundles. You get those two nutrition components for free. Uh, And we also have individual MAPS programs. You can find all of them at mindpumpmedia.com. Dude, did I tell you guys I got a uh, I got some I got a DM from someone who listened to the episode where I talked about how the Organifi green juice potentially could increase your seminal Seminal volume. volume. Did I tell you guys about this? Was it a rep or was it just random person? No, it was it was a girl. Oh. Who actually was? It was a group DM. So a girl and her boyfriend messaged me, and she's like, "I've been wondering what's going on, but my no. bro- and because my boyfriend's been taking the green juice twice a day." <laughs> <laughs> then they send me a picture. Well, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Wow. Last part was well, a joke. That's too much. But they did message me and say that they've noticed the increase in uh, semen. So I don't know if that's this a is selling a great point topic, or not. Guys. I don't know if this is a selling yeah. point or not. But did it change the taste too? I don't oh, know, Christina. <laughs> like, that's Christina. disgusting. Now he's lying. He knows. We have that's lines not- here. We have lines <laughs> we don't cross. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, diet affects it. I'm just saying. Does it really? Yeah. What about does. pineapple? Is that really true? Eating pineapple? I don't know. What makes I, th- I feel like you would know better than any of us. <laughs> let's be honest here. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Been meaning to ask Adam. Justin only knows. He's just like withholds information from fault me. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, 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 only, Adam only knows what his tastes like. Yeah. <laughs> 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 he just, no. 
Oh, <laughs> and that's the ultimate. Hey, hey that's thank, the hey, ultimate level of narcissism. Thank God, thank God we signed Organifi for a year because the last few commercials we've been yeah, doing it's a little racy. I don't think we're doing so. It's Imagine, the ashwagandha in the green juice because ashwagandha is is it boosts fertility in men, and that's probably one of the ways it does it. I want to speak Ooh, for I Doug see. right now because I know Doug's probably thinking it because I know he manages the accounts and sees as much as I do. And Organifi's uh, commissions came in the day, and we're we're down. We're like one of our we had our lowest week last week. Did we really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so we had one of our lowest weeks, and it might be it might because, be up this week. Yeah. Right. <laughs> seminal, I don't know. All the seminal volume talk. I think we had. A, I think that was a commercial you did last week where you talked about that. I don't know, man. I think I don't think that angle works. Uh, maybe we should ask our audience. Who, I don't. I mean, I want to DM me if you bought if you buy yeah. green juice after this, after this commercial. <laughs> Definitely a different angle. Yeah, Christi- how, Christina, how, aren't you aren't you working with Organifi too? No, I'm not. Oh, you're not. Who are you working with that we've worked with? I know you're working with a few. I know. Thrive. I know Taylor. A podcast of P Diddy over there is fucking thrive. <laughs> thri- oh, thrive! P. Diddy of podcast. Health IQ. No. Just thrive. Yeah, I think you just thrive. Oh, they're the only ones. Yeah. Oh, mm. I didn't know that. Yeah, no. That's Taylor you- needs to step it up. I keep telling him. Are you not, not complimenting his hair? Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's your fault. Then. You have he's to do that. Do. That's the first thing. He's got to do, do some work before I give some compliments. Yeah, oh, well, wow. you're wanting work for him. Oh, wow. You got to woo him a little. Not how. Yeah, it's not how. We got to teach you how that works these days. You got to say nice things. Got to butter them up. What'd you guys do this weekend? Well, let's see. What did we do? Uh, oh, I got my tooth. Uh, is it today Wednesday? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you took a day off. I was of like work. weekend. Wait a minute. Or you took a day off of work. Yeah. What happened yesterday, dude? The sign that you guys uh, that's going to be put up on the wall over there is freaking awesome. Cool, right? Yeah. It's really it's real too. Real moss. Yeah. No. How do you water? Gives that? a whole new look. Oh, it's not real moss. No, it's not. It's made to look. It looks real though. But now it you just feels gave it, real. You gave it away. Everyone I thought, thought it was real. It felt what? real. It's called a living wall, but it's a fake living wall. So it's a dead wall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, forget it. Well, Justin told me it was real. I thought it was real. I mean, I still believe in Santa Claus. We were going to so. do a real living wall, and uh, it's I, incredibly hard to maintain, especially in a space like that it doesn't get good light. Hmm. So that was the, no, we're not doing that. So 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 now it looks real, but it's not. No need to water it's it. Fine. I like that better. Yeah. Right. That's more our yeah, style. It looks, yeah, it looks awesome yeah, for I'm, what it is. I'm more down with that. What about uh, what you guys end up doing yesterday besides that? You guys, you did a bunch of videos, huh? Yeah, I, I slapped intros on some of the videos that you did and Ben Pollock. I'm really excited for the Ben Pollock videos to come out. Those are really cool. I like the way they're shot. I think it's cool that we're in that big text gym. Did um, you watch the videos yet? That, that- I'll, every, time, every time you guys do a video, I watch the whole thing. I get headsetted up and listen to the whole thing, and then I intro it. Mm-hmm. Even if I know what was in the video. How did they come across? Good. Good. I really like the ones you've done recently. I think like you're really hitting your stride the way you're communicating the information that we're providing for people. You know what I think? I think it's more effective on YouTube when there's one of us on screen and not all of us on screen. It's it's, more engaging that way. Well, it's hard because... It's hard because we like to do everything together. Well... It, we've you know also. We like to do boy things, we guy do. things together. We, guy things. Yeah. All about we guy were just things. we were just roughhousing of, earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little little wrestle, little, little tussle, little tussle, wrestle. <laughs> it, it was a tickle yeah. fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, God. Justin's known for his tickling. I just, I, I've heard. I I've seen. He Everyone lo- comments about that. He yeah. loses. Media. You know where you get Justin? Hey, right, like right where the cakes meet the thigh, mm. right in the bottom there. And that it's bodybuilders are called the glute. Ham yeah. tie in. Yeah. We call oh, it right. we call it the kick crease. Coochie coochie. You just, <laughs> I just go right for it. it just, yeah. And it's like Pe- ah! people like it. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Did you guys listen to the commercial that Justin made? When are we gonna air that, Doug? Or is that coming? I know you don't have a mic, so just give me the signal. Are we airing that anytime soon? Like a week, two weeks? Yeah, He's, a couple weeks. Okay, a couple, couple, couple weeks. weeks. Yeah, I recorded a few America, <laughs> a few commercials, you uh, know, f- my own flavor. Dude, we were you know how that all happened, right, Adam? <laughs> No, no. So this was what trip was the last one we were on? Austin. So we're we're about to get on the plane, and uh, and so Justin's like, I'm a, I'm gonna eat some uh, some cannabis edible chocolate balls. So he did, and we get Just on there. It all out there. It's all good, yeah. and uh, you know we get on there, and it, I can tell when it hit Justin because we're talking, and all of a sudden he's like inspired yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got down his phone Very and he inspired. was just typing away on his phone Jamming. the entire. The whole flight, like four hour flight, yeah. And you end up writing. I wrote like I a bunch was, of jingles. Yeah, I think it was six or seven commercials that I was like this. I was just trying to make it a little bit ridiculous because here's the thing, man. Like we've been like trying to present things in a certain light, and it's like 
you know, I just, I want to kind of turn that model on its head just a little bit, give it my own little flavor, little addition. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, what people think, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. It, I'm interested. I think the fans or the people that love the show or they've been listening, I hate same fans. The people that listen to the show like are it. friends. I don't like it at I all. Think you like I do it. not like it at Sal all. Sal likes it. Mm. Sal, <laughs> Sal likes it. I say follow all of my fans. No, no, I say, I say my followers. followers. Or YouTubers. Yeah. You are the tribe leader. Or, or YouTubers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually said that once on the. Hey, I actually said YouTubers. that on a YouTube video. I said, "Hey, what's up, YouTubers?" And T- <laughs> Taylor looked at me like, "What?" The Everybody fuck? watching, they're like, "I'm a YouTuber." Is that, is that you what they would call be me? the YouTuber. Yeah, I would be the YouTuber. <laughs> the people mm. behind this, like, because yeah, you're on YouTubing. YouTube. Yeah, right? I'm the I'm they're, the guy that I'm like, the guy that thought that twatting was when you tweeted something, but no, oh, it's tweeting. God. You say tweeting. So do we put that on a resume now? Like, I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> yeah. People do. Yeah, they wow. like for their jobs. I'm a professional. YouTuber. That's what my kids are most proud of. Is that true? Yeah. yeah oh. That's what they're called. They call, mm. I'm a YouTuber. If you talk to somebody who makes a living, I had YouTube. no idea I could add that. Yeah, yeah. add it to your I'm resume so... that you hand out to everybody. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? Because I'm the only one on LinkedIn. Can we, yeah. When yeah. was the last time one of you guys actually put a resume together? Over a decade. Never. Over a decade. 76. Yes. Never. Yeah. Only Sal was born then. I, was, I wasn't <laughs> born in 1976. <laughs> I never really needed one. Actually, yeah. I guess I did. A college. resume? I was always like, if you could put me in front of the person who made the decision, I was so confident that I would get the job. You just, yeah, talk your way in. And it's actually worked. Mm. The the mo- the best time I ever, the best example of that I ever had is when I sat down in front of a like v- regional vice president for Bank of America for investments. Now, mind you, I have zero experience in investments. I had zero experience in banking. All I'd done is managed gyms and health clubs and sales teams and all that stuff. Nothing to do with banking or anything like that. So I show up to this meeting and the guy said, first thing he asked me is like, what's your experience? And I go, I go off and uh, got the job that day. I actually got the job, got a what six figure job. Him? I just, Did you, you know, take it? Huh? Did you take the job? Are you did. honest? Why are you like, I don't know what the fuck. Uh, exactly what I said. In, in finance. Exactly what I I'm said. I'm your guy. Honesty is, ex- you got to be honest, but you also want to give the impression that, like, I'm very confident that if I don't know something, I'll learn it and then I'll do it better than, mm. than the people you have working for you now. Or I'll show you what I can do or I can prove. And people in sales like to hear that. Oh, yeah. Like, if I'm hiring a sales guy. you're hungry. Oh, yeah. And I feel like he's hungry, even if he has no experience or she has no experience. I'm always going to leave that table and be like, I think I'm going to hire that person. Well, those are always the best employees because it's like, then they're not coming in with all this uh, like previous knowledge where they're going to tell you what to do. Yeah. You know, and that's, yeah. that, that happens so, so much. So I got the job. I got a six-figure job as a premier banker for Bank of America, which is when you handle people with over half a million dollar in assets or something like that for the bank. I forgot exactly what it was. And they gave me- <laughs> Obviously, he wasn't very good at it. For dude, <laughs> terrible. They gave me 30 days to- uh, study and pass a, my Series 6 and Series 63 licensing test. So you've all heard of the Series 7, right? That's what stockbrokers. Yeah. So Series 6 is like a step below that. Not nearly as difficult, but still for somebody, it was like learning Chinese for me. It was literally like learning a different language. So mm. I, for a month, I'd show up at work and I'd sit down and, and study. And then after that, I passed the test and then I was just sitting in there and Bored as my bored out of my ass. Way too loud for the bank. I'm way too loud for that. I'm way too rambunctious. And uh, people who work in banking are pretty unhealthy. So that was a tough thing for me too. Cause they'd bring food in all the time, and then they'd ask me if I want some. I'd say no, and then they'd ask me fitness advice. And next thing you know, I'm telling people how to work out, and I'm like, well, I'm in a bank t- talking about how to work out. Yeah. I guess I'm not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> I wish I re- I wish I remember what Justin's resume looked like when it came across my desk. Did I even throw one? Of course out you like did. That? There's no way you would have mm-hmm. got a job. Adam there. said he almost Maybe didn't I did. hire you. Yeah, he said I that probably were, just yeah. He said it was a. Roll you know, of it's dice. funny. It's, <laughs> no, actually, what's really funny is at that time yeah, I, re- I remember when I was hiring and staffing at that time, and I was looking for trainers. And this was actually a time in my career where I decided that okay. I'm going to look for, you know, guys that specifically have a kinese or sports medicine, sports medicine or sports management degrees and look for that. And because before that, I was always searching people within the gym. Like the, yeah. I used to have a lot of success with finding the kid who was just like me working in the gym at like 17, 18 years old and like really passionate about what he's doing, wanting to learn athletic, whatever. And so that had that you represented a shift in my thought process of hiring 
And you and Nick at that time were trainers that I came across, you know, with uh, degrees. And I remember thinking like, okay, I'll bring these kids in. Let's see where they, where they go from there. I just wish I remember what it, what it Yeah. Said. I don't know. I, I know I shot my resume. I think first I went to the Santa Cruz one cause I lived in Santa Cruz. I just came home from Chicago and was like, fuck, what am I going to do? I have this degree. <laughs> it's worthless. You know, like it's <laughs> so dumb, you know, like <laughs> I have no idea where I'm going to go. And I was trying all these different, um, uh, things out. Like I was trying like sports marketing marketing out. I was trying out, um, different, um, different pursuits as far as like, you know, actual business like type ventures where I would like wear a suit and be professional. And that just didn't feel like me. And, uh, so I just thought, Hey, in the meantime, I'll work at a gym, you know, cause that's something I'm pretty comfortable and familiar with. And so I sent the, I, I sent them my resume first and then they basically, I think they passed on me, dude. And they like, were like, well, we do have an, uh, an opportunity. It's on the other side of the hill, you know, if you're willing to drive for it. And I was just like so <laughs> desperate. I was like not making any money. I remember going out on a date and my credit card got declined. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. On man. the date. Yeah. Right. She on the date. It was embarrassing as hell. I, I like, no, you know, I, I called a friend that came down and he <laughs> kind of covered me behind the scenes, but it was so long. It took so long. It was obvious. And she just was frustrated with me and then Dude, took that's off like me. the scene from whatchamacallit, that movie where he has to call his friend and he tries to play it all off and he's like stalling with dinner. It's, yeah, uh, I was stalling for days. Why can I not think of that 80s movie right now? Come on. It's a classic. Ridgemont. Uh-huh. Oh, Fast Times Fast Ridgemont High. Times, yes. Was it in there? Was yes. It? It's oh, the scene. Wow. Remember when the kid takes the girl oh, out on the yes. date? Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember in, that. They're sitting in the big high booth, and then he fu- he, for, he realizes he for left his wallet. He calls his buddy. Oh, yeah. It was a lot like that. I was at- They kept refilling yeah. the Cokes. I was, I was at Gordon re- Biersch. <laughs> I was at Gordon Biersch downtown, actually. I remember this vividly, and, and I just- <laughs> I, I don't even know why I'd like, asked her out. I'm like, what an idiot. I don't have money, you know? So I, was just, <laughs> I was like, hey, let's hang out. You know, Let's do something. Uh, I'll figure out how to pay you're, for you're it. Watch, uh, like, you're watching your order. She's like, I'll have the like, oh, uh, shit. the double like, burger, the fries. You're like, you sure you want to have <laughs> no, that? It's no, no, actually, gross. I'll have the steak and lobster. Oh, the sirloin. Um, yeah, yeah, the steak burger, please. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, you man. should get the water. It's yeah, super yeah, yeah. good here. And dessert. <laughs> no, no, no dessert. Yeah, no yeah. dessert. Damn, what about so. you, Adam? Did you... We, uh, what was I doing this weekend? Guy, oh, no, well, I, was at, I, I was at YouTube, so I saw YouTube. Oh yeah, that's right. How was yeah, that? So, oh, I, did I not? I haven't shared that on the podcast. I guess we. I forgot we didn't see you yesterday. Yeah. Um, fuck, bro. I mean, so this is my fourth time seeing YouTube, and I'm not a YouTube fan. So I've seen YouTube more times than any other band. But you're not even a fan. I'm not even a fan of their music, and it's not that I'm not a fan of the music. It's just they're not some. They're not a band that I ever really listened to that much. I appreciate some of their music. I don't. Uh. uh subscribe to a lot of their political views but what is true about the band is they put on the most epic fucking show and it's like not even close like all the other concerts i've seen in my life it's you two and then there's this huge gap and then there's two three four five six as far as like putting on the best performance you can literally hate the music put earplugs in go and watch that show you'll walk out saying that was the best show I've really ever seen. and the reason why is they're uh, they're the most world renowned. Innovative. Yeah, they're, they're the most re- world renowned band that tours today. Like, nobody is bigger than U2 worldwide. And they have the most amount of money reinvested back into their touring and, and all their equipment and gear and tech that they put into every show. And even though they're not always releasing new albums, every show you see and every time I've been to a show, they they're pressing the boundaries on tech and things that you've never seen before. So this time I I, uh, I call my buddy up who <coughs> always hooks up the uh, the tickets, and I mean I'm in the perfect seat. I'm mid row, 15, 15 rows back, like eye level, dead center. Like couldn't ask for better seats where we're where we're at. And I said, hey, so did you see this tour yet? And he's like, no, I haven't seen it, but I heard it's just like last year. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, my I brought friends to show them the the con. Then I was excited to show them. And I was like, whatever, I'll see the same thing. And I'm sitting down, we're waiting for the show to get started, and they have like the entire SAP center has a screen that goes the whole length of it, right? So it's fucking massive. And, you know, it's about, I don't know, 30 feet tall or so. It's super huge. And it's a huge catwalk that just goes all the way through the middle. Yeah, then there's a catwalk that goes down the middle of it, and there's a screen on the other side. So the audience on that side sees this massive screen I see on the side, and then there's a catwalk down the middle where they can sing and do things. Well, you know, it's the beginning. It's before the before Bono comes out. They have like some stuff going up on the screen. It's like blue and shit. And the the guys in front of me, I see, pick their phones up, and I'm looking at the fucking screen in front of me. And these guys go like this with their phone. And when they pick their phone up, 
I'm, I'm looking at something completely different. So you see me like this, I'm behind the, the crowd and I'm going, hmm. And I'm trying to figure it out. And so I get my phone out and I go to the camera and mine just looks like what looks out Is there like a special app? So YouTube this year mm-hmm. does this app called the YouTube Experience. And wow, that's brilliant. Oh, just wait, it gets better. So the way you they, they had it was I'm watching this shit. This, Bono comes out and he puts the phone up and Bono is this virtual virtual 3D image on his phone now. So it's not even like you're looking at Bono. It is Bono. It's his movements and everything, but he's digitally animated and 3D on the phone. And I can move it like this. Like, wow. Oh, dude. I, wow. I caught myself in the best seats of the house looking at the kid in front of me using his phone half the time because oh, I was so, so fascinated by the tech and what they were doing. So, And if correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe you know this, Justin, because you were in the music industry. <laughs> For a little bit. Shut what? Up. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, dude. That, that was, was a serious jab. I'm just sorry. There, I'm sorry. Man. No, but seriously. Uh, cor- correct me. Whatever, man. nerd. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Let's keep talking. Damn, yeah. Damn it. Uh, no, but for reals, what uh, I, I think that the mo- the majority of the money that these artists make now is on tour, right? Yeah, definitely. It is. And I feel like that's going to keep it's in a, the disparity between how much money you make mm. selling your music <clears throat> yeah. versus touring is just getting so, bigger and bigger, right? Okay, so now on that thought yeah, process, no, you're right. take this okay. one step further now. This is and this the technology's here, the NBA playoffs did it this year. They kind of failed at it. Intel was the company that did it. It wasn't that great, but it's here. Imagine this. You I'm telling you guys all the time about YouTube and you're like, "Oh yeah." And then you guys remember last minute tonight and you're like, Oh, fuck, that's right. The YouTube concert tonight that Adam said we got to watch it. And you get online real quick. You download your app. And oh, for $69.99 right now, you can have access. And you're going to get the view, like the best seats of the house of the same view that I'm getting. And you slap your goggles on. Your virtual goggles go on. And your headset or your speaker set. It's going to be so cool, man. And you're like you're sitting in my seats watching the same thing that I'm watching. They're going to make so much. You know why they have to do it that way? Because it's getting so hard to control the free sharing of music. And they don't sell albums like they used to anymore because, yeah. you know, back in the day, if there were two or three songs you really, really liked, you had to buy the whole album to get it. And what's interesting too, like, and I've talked to some people in the music industry still about how record companies have completely evolved and readjusted. So it's it's like you still get signed to, to big record companies, but the way now that uh, they own the content that gets streamed, so they've actually... Meanwhile, everybody thinks that um, you know uh, nobody's making money in this process. Well, the record company, record companies are making a shit ton of money. The artists are making way less money. So it's um, and the it's way that's gotten they, worse. And the way that the they artist. make more is, is tour. Yes, you know, be in person. Well, that's how the artists, performer. yeah, will actually make the money depending on the contract that they yep. they sign. I but. feel like it's going to get like that more and more with so many different industries because. So many different things are going to be so easy and so accessible yeah. uh, and so hard to patent that if, you know, like I can create a product and in the future you can 3D print it. You just download the blueprints or whatever. So it's like that person or person to be, it's actually going to be more valuable in the future yeah. than it is now because that's something that you can't copy until, of course, they come well, up that's with. Well, why, that's why I get excited about it because real artists, there's so many avenues for them to make money independently on their own now. And you see this, you know, it's just it just takes, like a lot of them just want to kind of put off the business end of it, right? Mm-hmm. Because I'm just an artist and I create because I'm passionate. I don't, I don't do it for the money. And it's like, no, dude, you, you need to make a living we all do, you know, but you know, there's actually ways to do that where you can keep control and maintain control of that. So, so I'm going to sound like an old barnacle here, but I didn't even know that Red Bull has been moving into this space, and I had no idea. Until what space? To the music industry. Really? Okay. So, okay, this is cool. I'm going to put you guys onto some shit right here. Sweet. I'm trying to get my phone going right now so I can get my the YouTube up, and Doug's going to hate me for doing this, but I have to show you guys this because I totally forgot about it, and I wanted to prep you, show you before the show so we could talk about it, but fuck it, we're just going to do it in the middle of the show. But um, <clears throat> So I, I turned you guys on to Tosh Sultana about two years ago, which at that time, nobody I knew, my friends, knew who she was. She's from Australia. She's an artist. And like one of the new hip things that's really cool to watch and i think it's i think it was hated on when it first came out but it's now evolving and you're seeing some real badass artists do this are these one or two man bands that are playing 12 different instruments and they're looping it because we have the technology to do this yeah now. you yeah. can play you're, one and, and record that yes and, and you're doing it right in front of people so red bull studios have got these dope ass studios that are set up which i'm going to show you guys in a minute all over the place and you're seeing these types of artists 
starting to pop out, uh, pop up everywhere and kind of do collaborations with each other. And <clears throat> I didn't, somebody shared the video with me first and I was like, this is a dope beat. Like I could totally, I, you guys I know will like this also. And I didn't realize it was Red Bull Studios until I caught like a glimpse of the guy's, mm. the, his drum set said Red Bull Studios. And I was like, oh, that's it. And then I caught another thing in the corner. Then I saw the Red Bull in the corner. So they like sponsored artists by Red Bull? So so check this out. So <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to. Red, so Red Bull so does smart. A, Red Bull so, does a good job finding like up and coming. Oh yeah. You know, they're just, I mean, they're a cutting edge company, right? They, they've always been right. As, as far as what they've been doing in sports, but to see them move into a space like, you know, music, I think is fucking so cool. Okay. So Doug, you're going to have to pause this right now. So these guys can watch this. Sick though, right? Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I, it's uh, I just came across it. Somebody shared it with me, and you know, of course, I like the music because I and I introduced him to Tosh Sultana, who I think is badass, and she, it's a single girl. I've showed you, I know for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. No, you showed all of us. Have you, you actually saw her at the SAP Center, right? No, how dude, did that go? No, oh. I saw her in a, the. I forget this. I've only seen this is the first concert I've ever been to, um, and at this venue in San Francisco, so I can't remember the name of it. But I mean, it's the. It was, was it big or was it a small venue? No, it was oh, okay. double the size of this room right here. Oh, I was thinking she was like in a big venue and I was like, how does that work? You no. know, if it's just one person. No, and super intimate. Mm. I mean, I was on to her from my brother-in-law who put her on or put her on to me at when she was like getting like 10,000 views. Mm. And we went, she was at San Francisco. I liked, I liked it. I was like, oh, this is cool. And I love finding like underground people like that, that I think are really, really cool. And I know are going to pop off and sure shit. I mean, she's now got 20, 30 million views on, on her stuff. Damn. But we went and saw her in this intimate setting that, you know, she walked in the front door and set up her gear and I had to step out of the way for her to get up. You know what I'm saying? It was like right through the crowd. The crowd was only like maybe a hundred people, 50 to a hundred people. You know, super private venue and shit. Do you guys like, think wow. that because because of how technology is making it so much easier, you think you're, you're more people or more kids are getting into music as I, a result? I think we're going to see better uh, and better I, I artists. I think so. I think we're going to see stuff Just because like, there's more of them, right? This to me is, I mean, I went on a, like, after I started watching one, I, I'm, this is how I get, I'm like, this is where I'm like you, where I find something I'm interested in, I like, and then I binge. Dive deep, yeah, yeah, I yeah. binged on all their stuff. And man, there's some really talented individual artists that are... I mean, this one guy's got like this amazing voice and he sings, he raps, he beatboxes, he does the looping the music. And this so, is cool, man. There's, it's he, cool because it's because they can post it themselves on, on YouTube. They can get their own traction. They can build them, their own authority. So I think this was already happening, right? That's already been happening for quite some time. I mean, fucking, uh, what's his face? Uh, Bieber. Yeah, Bieber got famous off of mm -hmm. YouTube. Mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant by Red Bull providing this for it and they're mm -hmm. probably out seeking out these people and showing well them. dude the, the the tide has already turned if, if if you don't if you're not jumping on board now you're fucked it's already been turning i mean i just sent you an article or all of us an article yeah, earlier this morning it. on how these these speakers and stuff people who have opinions or whatever they're not going on you know fox and msnbc and cnn and talk shows on tv anymore they're going on joe rogan and the rubin report and they're going on you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, ben Shapiro. Uh, yeah, whatever. Or the or that one controversial guy, whatever. Because they're reaching Sam Harris. Yeah, they're reaching way more people through new media than they would with the old media, yeah. and that's making the bigger impact. It's making more of an impact than than the other stuff. Like you could get in front of millions and millions of people now through new media easier than you could well, through old media. Yeah, media doesn't want you to know that. It's already happening. Like it's it's getting the majority of share of views and listens already. Like that's already the case. Like as far as like watching TV is is already sort of an antiquated thing now. Like a lot, as far as streaming in comparison with that. So Dude, I, I told you guys I canceled my my TV subscription or whatever, the dish and I don't even I don't even notice it's gone. Nobody cares. It's all Hulu, YouTube and, and Netflix. You we know just got to figure out how to get a better internet provider. That's that's where I want innovation to happen. Well, I, here's what I think is going to happen. Because now it is in the best interest of these massive internet companies to have people, to give people excellent access to internet, that you're starting to see them now invest money in that. Like Facebook is investing money on blimps that will fly Dude, over areas that I don't have it. internet and provide free Wi-Fi. Do that so, here. Yeah, you know I mean? think about it. If, yeah. you're, if you're a company like Netflix or, you know, like I said, Facebook or Amazon – more people having access to fast internet 
it only benefits you. It's this whole argument of uh, like the, when I argue with people about free markets and stuff and they're always like, who would build the roads? Uh, we need government to build the roads. Yeah. You don't think for a second big retailers wouldn't invest in finding ways to get people to yeah, the Yeah, obviously you want them to get to their <laughs> store locations. <laughs> and, they'll, and they'll compete over it, which, oh, means, no. which means if, if I want free internet access, because this is going to happen, if I want free internet access... I'm, or, or I want good internet access. I'm going to go with the best one, and then all of them are going to compete to provide it to me, so I'm going to go with the free one. So if I'm Facebook, I'm looking at all my competition, and I'm saying, let's give people excellent internet access, and let's make it free as fuck. In return, they'll see some of our ads, or they have to have Facebook yeah, in order we'll to get it. We'll sell all your information. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or some terrible idea. So <laughs> on, the, on the tech and me being an old guy, something else that I found that I thought was really cool, and I'm sure somebody's going to laugh at me. It's been around for a while. Uh, when we went to one of the last games we went to for the playoffs, I, I bought off a of StubHub. Now I used StubHub when it first started, and when it first started, uh, and what StubHub is for those that don't know what it is, it's a a place where all the people who own season tickets for any sporting event or concert seats or like that, they can put their tickets in this same place where people can find them to buy them. Mm. So if safe place for scalpers. So yeah, right. So that's ba- it's basically legal scalping is yeah. what basically what is it, it is. legal or is it gray market? Yeah, no, legal. no, it's legal. It's, okay. Okay. Totally legal. Yeah, it's 100% legal. Okay. So StubHub was, became the uh, the hub for that. Nobody else was doing that. They started to do it. Then they would have like in big cities like San Jose, you'd have a StubHub building or a room that they would rent out and I my buddy and I we would look at the tickets and oh the sharks tonight okay we wait for like an hour or two before the game get on there and see if there's any available seats where we want to sit oh there is one yeah. we click we buy then we swing by pick up the tickets then we go well obviously that was 10 years ago when I first started doing it it's now evolved to where it's a really it's an app I don't even need to get the actual tickets I can just they go took that scan. same model for uh, golf and, and so you could you could do like uh, like on like last second kind of things people like ditch out of and then they could resell that spot you can get it for super cheap yeah so what's cool is so that's how I, and i've known this for a long time because even back when you had to go pick it up it, it, the owners of the tickets they can sell it at whatever they want so if i buy season tickets and my season tickets are valued for these f- like f- close to the floor where i'm at uh they're valued at 500 dollars for face value but it's playoffs so i can get two three thousand dollars for those tickets right. But I also don't want to get stuck with him if I know I can't go to the game. So the owners do this thing where they do a like a stop like a stop buy on it where it's okay. It's like stocks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And every if it's two hours before the game, drop it by twenty five percent. If it's an hour before the game, drop it by another twenty five percent. Uh if it's, you know, thirty minutes before, drop all the way to the base of the the ticket value. Some will even go a little bit cheaper than mm-hmm. what their tickets were. So they Because it's more than zero. Right, it's more than zero. So guys like me who live in the cities of the teams that they love to watch, and it's really easy. And I used to live right down the street from the the. You uh, wait, you wait right, right before. Yeah. So Katrina and I, we'll get in our cars, we'll drive to the arena without even tickets. We'll go to the arena, get in the parking lot, sit in the parking lot. Thirty minutes before the game's about to start, pick the seats that we want to get, and I get them for about fifty percent of what I would have paid for them. On that. Wow. Now, that's just a small piece. Now that was what I already kind of knew this. I learned that. I just and I've been using that. But what I didn't know, and I got a pop up on it this last time. And it says, uh, would you like us to uh, pair with your Spotify? And I'm like, and I, you guys know how I feel about Spotify. I love that company. Sure. I've been following them. And I'm like, oh, leave it to Spotify. Fucking, this is cool. Mm-hmm. So I hit, I hit yes. So it fucking, it, what do you call that word? Like it scans over my, my Spotify. And then up populates, it read all my music that I listen to, up populates any concerts that I may want to go to in ar- around oh, me, so smart. based off the music that I listen to. So all my favorite bands all of a sudden are calendared out for me. And then I have the option to like or dislike. Then it goes further. Okay, so look at that. Oh, Red Hot Chili Peppers is coming. Cool, wow. like that. I want to go see that. Oh, Jay Z's over here. Okay, like that. And then so now it gives me a reminder. And then I can even go take a step further. I can click on the event and go. If any seats become available for $175, notify me. And then I just ignore it. It's six months down the of road. Of course. How badass. And is this that? is why mm-hmm. this is why technology really? mar- this is why markets make things so efficient and prices tend to go down and quality tends to go up. That right there. Because that efficiency, let me put it this way. If I'm a scalper or if I'm trying to sell my ticket before this technology existed, it was difficult. I I could put an ad out maybe in a newspaper or an ad out in a Craigslist or I could stand outside the arena, try and sell my ticket and I don't have a huge audience of people I could sell it to. It's not really a viable business. 
stuff, technology like this makes it so that people now, I would assume now people would buy season tickets now with the intent of saying. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. like the VRBO model. Yep. Same thing. It's like the VRBO model, Airbnb model. A lot of these smart people invest in tickets. Especially if you can get in on like a team that you know is going to be like, if you're really smart, you can get yeah. a hold of like Warriors tickets before the Warriors exploded. So you get them when they're down. It's like a stock. You get them when they're, mm-hmm. when they're low and they're not doing so well. So you can buy them at a great rate. You lock yourself in with that. Then you wait. Cause then when playoffs come around, the value of that, if that team hits playoffs right away, ticket prices wow. are double. And each round, like I'm every round, cause we're going every round, right? Where these playoffs for the Warriors, we're about to hit the third round. So we'll see what my ticket's going to look like. Mm-hmm. So far, it's doubled every single round. So it's for the same seats, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely money to be made if you're somebody who owns those tickets, but it's just like anything else. It would take a little bit of attention. Secondary, third, fourth markets, you know, beautiful thing. Mm. You guys have seen the car sharing uh, apps and stuff, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. like zip cars and things like well, that. Well, no, like if let's say you own you own three cars, right? And you drive one of them today. Well, there's probably two of them at home or one of them at home that you only drive sometimes. Otherwise, it's literally sitting in your driveway doing nothing. Right. Well, now they have apps where you can rent your car out to individuals, to other people. They can come grab your car and take it out and bring it back when you want. And so you're finding, like my cousin who lives in the city doesn't own a car, but when he drives down, he's always driving down like an Audi, a BMW or whatever. I'm like, where are you getting these cars? Like, where do you rent these cars? He's like, oh, I don't remember the name of it. So I know people are what pissed off right now. What they crash it? Yeah. Well, insurance. That seems always super that. Sketch. Insurance. That's, I'm sure that's easy. That's an easy fix. If I have, I have like, so give you a poor rating. When we rent cars all the time, they always ask if we want insurance. They say, no, we don't need your insurance. Your own insurance yeah. My own insurance. If I fuck your car up, like my own, that my, and now I'll be screwed. My insurance will go up. I got to pay, but it's still, but I, it, I'm like, covered. It's no different than like Uber or ride sharing where people yeah. used to say when that first came out, how do you know if it's safe? What if the guy's going to mug you or whatever? And driving Ubers and getting an Ubers are, are as safe or safer than taxis. And what they're finding with this share economy is that people actually work together pretty fucking well. And they rate each other and rank yeah. each other. Where Like eBay. Look, eBay is a great example. It's one of the first examples of how technology uh, really uh, kind of surpassed what people thought would happen. Like when eBay first came out, the criticism they got was crazy. Like, oh, your people are going to get ripped off trying to buy things online from other people that they've never met. Hmm. The reality is the return rate or whatever and the guarantees, eBay is extremely safe place to buy. In fact, it's safer than going to a you know, a flea market or a garage sale or whatever. It's a great place to buy things. And now we know, of course, eBay is a massive, and massive company. And if you company. do, you know, if there's any shenanigans, they just kick you off so you can't go back and be a seller again. Like you get bad ratings and enough things. The thing is, it does happen, but it's it, it gets regulated so quickly I think that it's even better. Oh, it's great. You can rent a couch. Do you guys know that? You can actually, there's yeah, apps where you're not paying for a room or whatever. You just pay to sleep on someone's couch. Like, think of all the other things. What are the things you guys think we could that, that people would be sharing? Oh, yeah. I wonder if it's going to be clothes. Fluids. I think, you know I mean? whoa. Yeah. That's, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Just, just, <laughs> you're on fire today, dude. Yeah. 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 Hey, and if you want to share a lot me? of flu- yeah. fluid, Try, try, try that green juice from Organifi. <laughs> uh, I was trying to set you up there. Do you want to blow big loads? <laughs> oh, terrible. Yeah. Who about, wants them? What about clothes? Think about that. Think about this. Like, let's, let's say you're a woman and you want to go out to an expensive dinner and you want a really, really nice dress. Yeah. I wonder if that would work where you can People go on an app. That. Yeah, uh, for nice dresses. Are there apps that do that? Yeah, there are websites. See, I fucking knew it. Yeah, for like prom and stuff, people do that. See? Yeah, because it's such a waste. You buy these dresses like a couple yeah. hundred dollars and then yeah. you wear it once. How much money is that going to save? So much money. Think about that. When you could just, what else can that, what else can can you share? Almost you every, share anything. Almost, yeah, anything almost, I mean, I think too, the, the restaurant thing that is going to change. There's so many people. That, oh, where you eat at people's houses? Yeah, where you eat at people's houses. People cook. There's oh, so yeah. many people that cook so well. Is that, that a thing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can go to a big city and instead of going to like the expensive restaurants, I don't know the name of this this app or whatever, but you get on there and like Uber, it's got ratings and people will have you come to their house, not by yourself. Typically they'll have a couple, like five people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you and four other strangers or whatever, and you get a home cooked meal by someone in the city that you're visiting or whatever. They have a rating. So you can see if this person's five star, four star, whatever. You pay the money, you show up and- Personally, I don't know about you guys, but for me, yeah. if I was going to a big city, I like going to restaurants, but I could also see the lure of going to someone's house, hanging Somebody out with a bunch of people. Nana. Yeah, yeah, having great <laughs> conversations. <laughs> Nana. Yeah. Dude, she's well, making especially, you lasagna. If it, especially if it was a really <laughs> oh. nice house and a fucking killer meal. Do you yeah. get to pick the meal? 
Or is it just whatever? I like? think they show you what they're going to serve or whatever. Yeah, you have options. So I don't think it's a menu. I think it's like, hey, come to my house for a night <laughs> of, you know, meatballs. We're having a hamburger food. helper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll pass. But then you can meet people and it's, it's you know, you're, you're making connections and I think it's great, but it's piss, it's decentralizing and pissing off a lot of the staple industries It's in basically this everything that's like highly, highly regulated is getting totally disrupted right now. I know. Anything, totally disrupted. Anything that we know that's not being disrupted yet, like is what What do we- I know, I'm trying to Even think. money. You know what it is? Even money's because oh, of yeah. crypto. You, you know, you know crypto is making know it's a stock exchange, right? Are they? For yes, sure? Yes, that's what I've heard. Oh, shit. Yeah. Let me you know check, what, my, you know me check my, my- You know what's thing. coming is that we, we haven't seen yet is education. Education is the next big one to get disrupted big time. You're right. Yeah. That, well, that, it's it's already. Big, I, I had it's already to, to it's steer, already happening. Yeah. It's, it's starting to, but it isn't though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like there's still. Here's the two things that are gonna. They're they're clenching hard the, to not let it happen. No, there's two things that are gonna blow the the lid off of that. One is there there's something like, and I posted the statistic like a few days ago. I don't remember the number, but there's something like X amount of trillions of dollars of student debt that's floating out there right now. That is when it hits, if when people start defaulting on it, because it looks like it's going to start happening at some point, it'll make the banking crisis look like like nothing. So it's going to it's we're sitting on a massive potential financial calamity with the amount of student debt that uh, that is out there. So that's number one. Number two, more and more you're seeing kids now who are weighing out whether or not it's worth going to college when we were kids. So that's one generation ago. That's it. When we were kids, it wasn't a question. College is worth it. Go to college. In fact, it was pushed so hard right. that nobody gave a shit what degree you got. It didn't matter what your degree just was. Go. They just hire you. Yeah. yeah, just go to college and and then worry about it. You know, when you're there. Now kids are looking at it and going, "Well, is it worth the cost?" Because the cost of college has exploded through the roof. It's got it's gotten so expensive that, you know, if I want to be a if I want to be in medicine and I want to be a general practitioner. Well, I'm going to graduate with two hundred fifty thousand dollars of, of of debt, and I'm going to be a general practitioner. And I may make a hundred and something thousand like dollars a year. It's those, not worth it. Yeah, I'd like to see those statistics on you know uh, as far as kids going to college and how many if it's really affecting you know the universities right now on a substantial level where they're not getting as many people to come and um, you know sign up for. It. I think we're starting to see it. I think yeah. more kids are starting to question it. So if you had made a YouTube video or any kind of a video 10, 15 years ago that said, you know, call it, don't go to college unless you don't want to do specific things. It's not worth it. People would have ridiculed you, made fun of you. Now you're getting a lot of voices that are starting to say that. A lot of people are coming out and starting to say that. And and I look, I'm one of the, like, I told my son this the other day. We had this conversation. I said, look, when it comes to college, it, you know, if you want to go, we're going to sit down and look at what you want to study and we're going to figure out if it's worth it or not. Because it is. It has to be worth it. It's not about just going for the sake of it. If you want to go to college and get a degree in something that doesn't require a degree, it's not worth it. Now, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something with a high barrier to enter that requires that, you know, that education, then it may make sense. But if it's something else, even tech, even getting into tech, it's starting to lose its luster where you're getting a lot of kids out of high school who are very tech savvy right. and tech advances so fast. By the time you get a degree in tech and some tech field, like the shit you learn the first two or three years is already obsolete. Yeah. And and I think we've talked about this. I think that a lot of the education is going to be start is going to be provided by the company companies. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, India and Asia are kicking our ass. You know, as far as like education with tech and, and coding, and we're just now realizing, oh shit, we should learn this. Yeah, it's like too late. You know, we should. I, I really feel like it would be to to our best uh, interest to to start learning more skills and things that like apprenticeships. Yeah, and apprenticeships and things that that. Will differentiate you a lot more than what I, the market provides. You don't, think, you don't think we just need more cry closets? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, Christina. Well, how do you oh, feel about I the cry closet? I have a lot closet? to say about that. Oh, oh I would I, love to hear it. I uh, well, I think about the cry closet or about what you're talking. Hey, you want to come on our show? You got to talk yeah. about it. Start I mean, start about the first thing. Yeah. About the, well, I think we're in the middle of a big shift with people not feeling like they have to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I. I mean, I went through this a lot. You guys have asked me before, like, what have I said that people get pissed at? When I graduated, I mean, I said, I wish I had dropped out of college earlier on. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I would have been way ahead of my career. I feel like mm -hmm. it put me behind because what I do now, I did not need. I mean, I definitely learned. I learned a lot, but it's not. I didn't need it, you know. Um, and it's really hard for people to believe now that they can go out without a college degree and make something of themselves but it's happening like you see all these people podcasting youtube 
Instagram. It's changing. Like, there are so many jobs. Anyone can go out there and be an entrepreneur. Um, And it's really hard for people to understand that. And I deal with this a lot with people my age who are like, they still don't understand how I can make a living, you know, not in a traditional job. Mm -hmm. And because more and more people are not going to have traditional jobs, like it's going to change the space. And as people learn to accept that, I think people are finally going to realize they don't have to go to college. It's becoming obsolete. There there are certain degrees and certain things are starting to become, look, we are- Did you run up debt, Christina? Did you have a bunch of debt Mm -mm. from school? You didn't? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's, she's a hustler. We, we, we were in the process of looking for like video, really good video editors. Now, what we don't really care about is your education. We had a kid come in here and we just want to see the work that you do. Mm -hmm. And that'll determine whether or not we hire you. And it's getting like that more and more, especially in the tech field. Like they're going to want to see what you can do it's the rather 10, than thousand hours. Yeah. yeah, you know, like the more the, the the quicker you can figure out what you want to do and get those hours in, the better you're off you're going to be. I mean, it's it's tough because a lot of people want to be super well rounded and know everything, but you know, like figure it out. Once you figure that out, you're going to be so much more. It's successful. cost cost benefit. Look look at it this way. Look at your degree. Look at what it's going to potentially provide you, and then look at the cost of that degree, and then do the math. That's it. So like, let's say right now I wanted to have a career in the fitness industry. Let's say I really have a passion for fitness, want to be in the fitness industry. I want to manage big gyms. I want to be the top of a corporate fitness company. Now I can go to school and get a degree in a fitness related field like kinesiology or sports medicine. And maybe, and I, let's say I'm looking at the best, best schools and I look at it and I say, okay, it's going to take me four years or maybe six years if I get a more advanced degree. And it's, I'm going to, it's going to run me a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars in debt at these top private colleges. I don't have that money, so I'm going to go into debt. So I'm going to graduate six years later. So now I'm six years older with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage or whatever over my head, and then I'm going to go and apply at a gym. And guess what the gym's going to do? They're going to hire you as a trainer. Yeah. Or entry level. Or I could go get a certification. And, you know, go do a good interview and get hired in the same position. Now I have six years. And instead of that six year time of acquiring and accruing debt of $150,000, I can make money. And if I'm smart, I can invest that money. And now six months, six years later, I'm in a management position with six years of experience. I don't have $150,000 of debt. In fact, I probably have close to $100,000 in investments if I was smart. I mean, which one's better well, off? The real, and that's just one the example. Real, the real argument that you that we have or that people have is that, you know, college does a really good job of curating the information that you need for this degree, quote unquote. But what I think is different today that we didn't have the access to when we were in school that is so unique and it's tough, I think, for us even to speak on is that, man, we, you now have at your fingertips on your mm-hmm. fucking iPhone the the ability to learn everything that 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 kid that's going to that Ivy League school is learning. Yep. He can come home or she could come home from school and say, "I learned about this, this, and that." And you could get on your phone and right then and there Google that exact topic and get a plethora of really good information. You can see well, lectures really, for free. It's threatening to people. Yeah, it's like how did I learn all this stuff about gut health? I was on Google in college. You know, mm-hmm. I knew more than like the med students. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. And I, th- but I also think it depends on what job you're trying of to get. Of course. Oh yeah. You know, because- some of them have a different, have a high barrier to enter. But that, yeah. that's the, but even that's fucked up. Right. When you look at teachers, lawyers, doctors, all these things like that, like they, they put that standard there, but I still think there would be a better way about that. I mean, I think any surgeon would even argue that, okay, the eight years of school that you had to do before you even did your internship and started to get hands on and do all those things, where did you learn most most of everything that you know or your skill set mm-hmm. would be mm-hmm. when you probably started getting hands on it. What if you would have started that eight years ago and then you had the access to learn all the information that you Bro, were learning? It's a via, painful realization. Yeah. I've had this conversation with several close friends of mine. Um, and People get heated over it. Dude. Well, here's why they get heated because they're sitting there. Well, nobody wants to know they wasted 120. That's right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, right. A, that's like, that's good. And some people, it worked well for them. Some people, they, and here, and there's where I'm, I agree with it and I'm okay. Is that some people need that structure. Somebody needs, some people want to go to school and worry about Friday where we're going to party and what we're going to do. And then the only time that I got to worry about thinking or growing is when I'm in my classroom, my professor is, is lecturing me, I'm taking notes and then I pass my test. And I need that structure to get me to the level that I need to get in order to enter the market at this certain 
education level. I just think it's it's a horrible way to learn. And like people, I mean, we study the way education is structured. We study for the test and then we forget it. That's right. Yep. It's just so much pressure just to get a grade, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, all, but also it just pisses me off how there are so many jobs where you get paid based on your level of education, mm-hmm. you know? So that's why it's hard. For people who it, are going in into this, it's here, really scary. It's here, really scary. It is. Here's people. the arguments that I hear from the, the, my friends. Like, we'll sit down and talk about this, and it, it makes them mad again because nobody wants to admit, like, oh fuck, I wasted like four years and a lot of money, and you know, you're making good points. They don't want to admit that. So here's what they say: They say um, uh, employers want to see it on your resume. So that's one of the big arguments. So okay, so you spent a hundred grand so that you could have something on your on your resume. Okay. And here's the second thing that they'll say. Oh, I learned responsibility. I learned how to like, you know, get focused. I learned and I'm like, you know, those are skills you would have learned in the workforce had you applied yourself. In fact, you would have learned them you wouldn't have been better. Late, right? Like I was always late to class. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you wouldn't be late to your job. No. You fired. No, not at all. Yeah. So it, I mean, and sometimes, you know, professors take that really seriously, which I appreciate. But yeah. you know, it's a different culture. It's a different environment. And I feel like it it's sort of like um uh, what's it called? Purgatory. It's like yeah. a purgatory where people just need that because they need to find out who they are, their purpose, where they want to go with their life. And if you're in that, you fall into that sort of category. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's good for that. But I mean, even then, like we should be, we should be fostering that earlier. In, How is it good for that? I'm just, in, in terms of like, if you anyone? have no direction, if you have no direction, you to spend all this money to figure it out, people don't <laughs> usually figure it out. <laughs> right. That's well, true. it's people I mean, change yeah, majors you, average of three or four times, yeah, and but they you, don't. I have could a argue. Job. I could argue Justin's point. I think that some people are just you're. We're in a room right now with a bunch of entrepreneurial minds and self motivated people right now. So it's really easy for us to see, oh, this is ridiculous. There's no way this has any yeah. value anymore. It's so silly. I wish I would have known this. I would have dropped out of college sooner. But that's you, though. No, because it you has have, value for It's for safety-minded. Yeah. So yeah. Well, for somebody, yeah, the other thing is it, it prepares you well to work for somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what the real structure is. Either it like to become a professor, to become a teacher, to become like you know uh, somebody that yeah. works a nine to five. Like this definitely is a structure in place. But for even that. just okay, let's just like look at the way college is structured. Why do you need two years of GEs? Like, why can't we just hop into our our major, our right. skill set? Mm-hmm. Like that is just a, it's waste a well-rounded of time to me. argument. Like, yeah. why do I have to take a class on? folklore and rock and roll like i don't need this it's, you know what i mean because it's a, i don't disagree because it's a fucking yeah. racket okay let me yeah. explain something to you when you look at markets in america that far exceed the explosion of uh inflation what you're looking at are markets that are just inundated with cronyism education the housing market the the medical market like the health market all those markets have a lot of fucking government involvement and there's a lot of cronyism look let me let me explain something to you I'm going to go and take a college class where they're going to require me to buy a book and I'm going to spend $300 on a book. Where in the world does a book cost $300 fucking dollars? Never. If it was a real free market, colleges would be competing to give books free. They'd give you electronic books. Oh, the, oh, the, oh, you want the book? Oh, just download it. It costs you nothing. That's what they would end up doing. But they don't do that because it's a fucking racket. In a higher education needs to be it needs to crumble it needs to completely be revamped and it's going to crumble on its own and we're talking about you guys are talking about how people are going in there and and trying to figure things out here's the cost of that the cost of that is to the average american taxpayer because when that big student loan bubble pops who do you think is going to bail it out we are Mm -hmm. it's going to be a mat like we bailed out the banks they're going to be like oh we need to bail everybody out and they're going to we're going to end up paying it with either inflation because they're going to just print a bunch of money to do so no you're right or they're going to tax us it's a very dangerous precedence and and part of it is culturally this whole notion that you if you want to be successful you have to go to college and then they use statistics that are misleading for example if you look at the average person who got a four-year degree and you look at their average salary and you compare it to the average person who just went graduated high school and their salary, yes, the average person who graduated with a four-year degree makes more money than the average person who graduated high school. But that's not a that's not it's a very misleading statistic because what you're doing is you're taking everybody who went to four years of school, paid money, and actually was serious enough to complete college with everybody that just left high school. Why don't we compare apples to apples? People who left high school, who decided they knew what they wanted to do, and who were very serious 
versus people who graduated college. Let's compare those two people, and then let's see if there's a difference. And I bet you there isn't. In fact, I bet you the people who left high school knew what they wanted to do, worked hard to it, worked hard, uh, hard towards it. At the end of four years, were ahead, maybe not in salary, but ahead if you count debt on top of it, because they had no debt, but they also had money that they saved right. and possibly invested. So, this is the rea- this is the conversation that people need to be having. In some circumstances, with the current cost of higher education, in some circumstances it makes sense. In many circumstances, it makes no sense. If you want to get a loan to go and get a master's degree in English, um, not worth it. Unless you want to be a professor, not worth it. You want to get a degree in anthropology, not worth it. You want to get a degree in liberal arts, probably not worth it. Why? Because those degrees don't pay you back nearly the money that you invested. Now, if you're going to school for medicine or law or other fields that require these types of things, which I think are going to change also at right. some point, mm-hmm. right now, I can I can kind of start to see that. And the other thing too is the way government inserts itself with higher education by literally making it so easy to get a student loan, so easy, and nobody gives a shit what you spend the money on. You know what a lot of kids spend their student loan money on? Food, fucking, you know, pay for my car payment, you know, I'll spend some on school or whatever. That You know what that sounds like? That sounds like the fucking housing bubble, remember? Yeah. When you go get a loan for a house right. and they wouldn't- Pull even, out and go buy a nice whip. Yeah, or they wouldn't even ask you any documentation. Like you could say you make a half a million dollars a year and they'd be like, oh, cool, here's your loan for $1 million and here's your payment. When it balloons up, we won't worry about it or whatever. Yeah. You know, what ended up happening there? Same mm-hmm. thing that's happening with, with education right now. So, And, and the, with the ease of accessibility to information- I'm sorry, it's a it's a crime, and companies are starting to see it now. They're starting to here. Here's what you get when you go to an expensive. Well, that's uh, what we private- needed. We needed everything to be have access to it, and not, that was the biggest control they had was the um, the ability to to withhold all this information from you know these like high level professors or people in the field that are like world renowned or mm-hmm. or whatever they're going to sell you on, but. That's not the case anymore. So it's it's really doesn't have a whole lot of weight. No, you know what you know what a lot of people still go to these expensive schools for. Still, it's not for the education. It's not. It's for the connections. St- yes, status. Yeah. It's the, the connections. Network, yeah. And it still and it still carries that. Especially of course, some prestigious, especially schools. Ivy League schools. Oh, if you're, oh, yeah, if you're spending about a, the network, if you're spending a hundred thousand dollars a year on a college, which some of them can be upwards of ridiculous amounts of money, you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of kids who could spend a hundred thousand dollars a year on school. So you're going to make some connection, and all that stuff. So it just what it's doing is what people think education is supposed to remedy, which is the separating of the classes or whatever. It's only making it worse. Yep. You know what I'm saying? I agree. It's crazy. I think, like I said, I think what you're going to start seeing is people are going to go to companies and corporations to learn from them, get those certific- certifications. I think companies are going to start asking people, show us what you can do. Not, we don't care what your degree is, but here's a, here's a project. Complete the project. Bring it back to us like we did. Yep. Like when we're hiring a video editor, that's what we're going to do. Edit this video. If we like it, you're on board. If we don't like it, yeah, I don't right. give a shit we what like your, your experience decision is. making process. Yeah, I don't, I don't care. Yeah. This clause brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. Okay, Carmen Alessa. If it's not possible to separate cardio and weight training, which one should you do first? Sounds like Carmen Electra. Remember her? Mm. Oh, yeah. I had a poster of her back in the day. She was hot. I normally tell people to do which is more of a priority first. So, for example, if I'm talking to a a real skinny physique and you are coming to me because you need a lot of help building muscle and that's what's more challenging for you but you also want to make sure you do cardio because you still have a little bit of body fat that you say you want to lose i i'm going to make sure we weight train first because i want all of your energy all of your focus everything you can into your programming of your weight training and then any cardio that you need to do afterwards we would do afterwards and if the the other was true if you are putting muscle on is really easy for you you're not like desiring a lot more muscle you would you need to lose more body fat and that's more of a focus well than that i'm going to put my energy and focus on mm. on that first you know what even though even there though even for somebody who wants to lose I know, a lot of fat lifting first i'd probably still- have them lift first you know the only person i would have do cardio first is the person with endurance goals like someone who wants to develop 
lots of endurance. In that case, I would have them do right. That would give you the person. Yeah. Another example of somebody who cardio is a high. So it's whichever one's more of a whichever one's more of a priority. Yep. I'm doing first. Like I, I would question this person too because I don't know if we're talking about aesthetics right now or not. But like, why does cardio have to be involved? Mm. Well, I, mean, she, I, I, I think get, she's a CrossFit athlete. She's pretty shredded. I looked at her profile. She's okay. like really, really lean. And I think she does CrossFit. And so she's trying to figure out like which one should, which one, here's the funny thing. This really brings up an interesting topic about how the body adapts. Cause they've done studies on this. This has actually been studied where they'll compare groups of people who do cardio first and weight training second, and then weight training first and then cardio second. And what they find is the people who do the weight training first gain more strength. And the people who do cardio first gain more endurance. Duh. That's what I'm saying. You put the yeah. focus on whatever you care about. is Whatever one you care about most, you prioritize. But how interesting is that, right? It's like you're still doing all of it, but it's the body prioritizes what you do first, not what you do last, which can almost sound counterintuitive. You, you would think that it would be the one that you would leave off with that would send the stronger signal. Mm. My theory is that when Why you're- Why do you think that? Yeah, because it's the last thing you did. But you've got like more. You've got more oomph at the beginning. And, and give it your all. That that's true, and, and that's what I was going to say. I think it's because you're fresh. Your CNS is fresh. Your muscles are fresh, so you're sending a louder signal mm. with whatever you do first, and then the second thing that you do. Yeah, you've literally switched whatever mechanism is your priority. Dude, this girl is diced so this up. Is what we need to yeah, do. She shredded. I told She's you. diced. Yeah, why? Do, you. Why? Why cardio? I why are we she, even doing cardio? Because people are obsessed with cardio. Yeah, there's no reason to do cardio. Maybe for endurance for her, you know, for yeah. for stamina. Yeah, I would. Which then, okay, I get it. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And I, I think there's someone who's like that. I would. You could weave in and out. Why not do it before sometimes, and then do after? And then pay attention if your lifts are suffering. Like mm -hmm. if you do it before, you know, are are your lifts as as good as you want your lifts to be, and is your body responding? And do you have the muscle mass that you want? If it's not, then prioritize prioritize weightlifting. If That's right. And and use this now. Here's something interesting you can do with this particular concept or principle of what you work first is what your body tends to adapt towards more than what you work second, third, fourth, and so on. So here's what's real, real cool about this. Now, when you look at a, a workout that's programmed and put together, if it's put together properly, now individual programs are different. I'm talking about if someone designs a program for the masses, like MAPS, for example. If you look at a MAPS program, typically at the beginning of the workout, you'll find the hardest, biggest gross motor movements first. Mm -hmm. And then it'll move down the row. And then at the end, you're typically doing the lighter, easier exercises. And the reason why we do that is we want most of the adaptation and gains to go towards the gross motor movements because there's a lot of carryover from those gross motor movements. You're going to get more bang for your buck. But let's say you're a, a, a person who wants to sculpt their body. Let's say you've got muscle built, you've got a solid foundation, and you're, you're gonna, your workout starts off with squats, but you have really lagging hamstrings. Let's say you're a physique competitor, your hamstrings lag. Well, now you can use this principle and hit your hamstrings first. Now you can break the rules a little bit. Instead of squatting at the beginning of your workout, you can go do some hamstring curls, some single leg deadlifts, some stiff-legged deadlifts, or other hamstring exercises to hit the hams first and then go hit the squats. And what you'll find, and I've been doing this for years when I train clients, when there's a weak muscle group or when there's a recruitment pattern that I want to create, is I'll mix it up and I'll I'll put the one that we want to focus on most first. Right, you prioritize it That's first. It. That's That's it. That was the, I think that was the simple answer I was trying to give with this is whatever is more important to you at that time. And that could potentially change. Maybe you look at your physique right now because obviously she cares about aesthetics. She looks amazing. And maybe you look and you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I feel a little soft right now. I want to lean out a tiny bit. Well, prioritize car cardio for the, for a couple of weeks and then see what happens. And then see, I guarantee you're going to lean out. And then if you like what's happening, continue on that direction. If you don't and you feel like you're start, your muscles starting to sacrifice, then flip-flop it. Well, this also feeds into why we sort of, uh, you know, try to try to educate people on the uh, what a proper warm up looks like. So, you know, the old adage of I'm just going to go out and kind of warm up my body by going for a light jog or, or running around, you know, a few laps and then getting to my workout after that, which now all of a sudden, yeah, realize that what you're prioritizing right away, this is more endurance based. You're telling your body, mm -hmm. I need to endure through this workout. You're not versus priming. Priming is exactly. totally different concept. It's something that uh, I'm trying to generate, you know, this loud signal from my CNS. I'm trying to get full body muscular tension. And what does that look like? It doesn't look like just a light jog. Right. No, no. And what you're doing is you're trying to, you're trying to prioritize a signal 
that you want to send. And when you do cardio first, even if it is for a light warm up, you're going to take away a little bit from the signal that you're trying to send later on when you're lifting weights, unless the signal you're looking for is endurance. Like if you're an endurance athlete and you have to do your run and your workout with weights all at the same time, like you have two hours or whatever, and you're an endurance athlete, yeah, I'd say I'd say do your endurance training first and then finish off with your resistance training. Otherwise, resistance training should be first above and beyond cardio for most people because most people, they want enough endurance to be able to work out and live their regular lives. Most people aren't looking for maximum endurance. What most people going to the gym are looking for is to sculpt and change the way their body looks, if we're being honest, right? Oh, yeah. And the, 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 the adaptation signal you want to aim towards that's going to give you the biggest yield in terms of aesthetics and changing and sculpting and shaping your body is strength, is building muscle. That's where you're actually literally shaping your body, in which case you want to do your resistance training first. Well, I talked about this way back when I was competing, and if if your goal is not to have endurance, like Sal saying, like if it's not that, like that's the only way I'm even implementing cardio like this at all. Like if, if you're like, I need to have stamina, I'm running a Spartan race, I'm going to CrossFit, and I want to be good in my wads, so I have to have that endurance, like it's getting programmed in. Otherwise, if you're aesthetic, like I'm – I'm manipulating your nutrition program and your weight training program as much as I can without any added cardio. Mm-hmm. You don't need to. I can get you diced the way she looks right now, which is ama- or with the, some of her pictures that she has on her Instagram. I can have you looking like that with zero cardio. Mm-hmm. It's totally possible to build your physique. Now, what I can't guarantee you with no cardio is stamina endurance. Sure. Like you, I, I can't train you to look like that and then also expect you to go run a Spartan race or do a CrossFit wad and kick ass sure. at it. You know so, what promotes a good wad? What's Organifi. That? Boom. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Bringing Dude, it back. It's like five commercials in one, <laughs> oh. man. Bringing it back. If that doesn't drive sales, I don't know what's going to. <laughs> you mentioned that. I was like, we got to really hammer this home. You know? <laughs> Ashwagandha. Yeah. Ashwagandha. It's going to do Next it. Next question, but. please. Okay. Dining with Dio. Should I ever get a weightlifting belt? Oh, the controversy. No, I'm glad, Why? We're, I'm glad we're talking about this now because I think that this is there's a handful of things on our show that we've either talked shit about or said something about, and then we've kind of like been, okay, I can see some applications for that. And, and we have different views. And I feel like the weight belt, we've kind of been back and forth on mm-hmm. a little bit. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think we, it's a hard, it's no, the one or lifting, hard, it's the one lifting aid that I use, you know, semi-regularly above all else, like squat shoes. I may use, I haven't used them for a long ass time. Never use wrist straps, a weight belt, something that I'll use uh, maybe a couple days a week on my really, really heavy lifts. At, right now, I'm using it a lot because I'm going super heavy. But and Justin never does. Never right? uses it. Never uses never, it. Never, ever. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, here's what a weightlifting belt does, okay? it's and this, I'm going to be totally honest. And I use it. I use it a lot. In fact, I just p- posted a video where I was doing some heavy farmer walks wearing a weight belt. And somebody asked me, why are you wearing a weight belt? And I was very honest. So I can lift more weight when I wear a weight belt. That's Mm -hmm. why I I did a video for the Instagram and I wanted 425 (laughs) pounds of ours. And if I I didn't have the belt on, I probably would have done 400 pounds. And with the belt on, I did 425. Right. So what does a belt do? A belt creates more core stability. And the way it does this is a real belt, by the way, not the shitty skinny in the front, fat in the back, you well, know, weird body belts. Tell them the technique behind that. Yeah, yeah you, want a, you want a thick belt that goes around your waist, and, and, they're, and they're very thick. If you ever hold a real weight belt in your hand, it's thick, it's, it's made very stiff, and you put it around your body, you put it on real tight, and what happens is your core pushes out against the weight belt, and the belt creates more core stability, which then allows you to lift more weight. Some people say, oh, I need to wear a belt, a belt to protect my back. Well, Yes, it does protect your back when you're going with weights that you can't do without the belt. But if you lifted weights that you don't need the belt for, then your back should be safe as well. So should you get a weight weightlifting belt? It's up to you. I mean, if you're competing with I the feel weight like belt, it's you a, should. I'll I feel it. like it's a really good feedback mechanism. And what I mean, or feedback tool. So in our uh, prime, we have a, three zone tests. And the, f- the first zone test is we teach you to get up against the wall and you have these points of contact, the back of your head, your wrist, your elbow, your low back. And the idea is to see if you can travel your hands over your head and keep all those contact points. And if you can't, then you fail the test. Now, that test and that or that and that can, can, can technically be an exercise and a corrective exercise for somebody does not require a wall. 
does not require that you have a wall. But what the wall does is gives the brain and gives the person trying to figure out what to do a feet feedback. And I think the same thing with a, with a belt. Like a lot of people just don't know how to activate their core and lock down their spine. And when they get, especially when they're squatting, because squatting and deadlifting is such a mechanically chal- or challenging type of movement. So when they do that, the belt, I think, provides this artificial feedback for them to do that. Now, just like the posture thing that I would teach somebody, that's a tool. I, you don't need, I don't need, we can't have to rely on a wall for you to get in good posture. I'm trying to get you to understand how you're supposed to feel so I can use those the, the wall as cues the same way that I'm trying to understand you how to control and activate your transverse abdominus by pressing against the belt, even though it's a different... It's a different recruitment right, pattern. Right, it's a different recruitment pattern, but it's still the awareness of the core and how important that is if you lock it in and stabilize it in a squat. Someone like Justin, who's trained for so long with good technique without a belt has trained to lock his core in really well. Mm-hmm. And you can see it in his squat. When he drops down in his squat, his core is is locked really well. I This was something I was not good at, and I'm still not good at it. So like Sal, I weave in and out. In fact, I actually squatted. Ironically, we're talking about this question. I squatted with a belt yesterday for the first time in probably six months. And it was just because it was the first time that I was I wanted to challenge myself weight-wise. I hadn't done anything for singles or doubles for squats with since the Achilles, and so I have just no reason to challenge it. And I didn't go crazy, but right now for me, anything over 250 is you know scary weight for me because of the, um, the injury. So I was, and the last thing I wanted while I'm thinking about my Achilles and everything else going on was my core to fold. And I know that if I have a belt, it's kind of like cheating for me. Mm-hmm. It allows me, I can feel my, my abs pushing against it as I come down. It gives me good feedback and it helps me protect my spine. So, but that's how I like to use the belt is as a tool, as a way to get people to understand what it's doing. And you want to really learn to train yourself to do that intrinsically, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely don't past judgment, you know, with these tools and accessories, as far as you want to use wrist straps, you want to use, uh, belts and you're actually lifting, you know, substantial amount of weight and, um, you're competing. I get it. You know, I get it. I definitely get it. But, um, if I'm going to be real and honest, like the way that I look at it is I didn't do the work. I didn't do the intrinsic work that it takes for me to be able to stabilize properly, to go through all the channels in my kinetic chain, to be able to, um, you know, put this load or, or carry this load into this exercise. And so therefore I need to go back and reassess where the deficiencies lie. So for me, it's, and, and it's tough because like you said, it's decades, it's decades of mechanic work. It's decades of, um, being under the, the barbell to figure out kind of where you are and how to brace properly and how to kind of get everything working simultaneously the way that it needs to, because the belt really does provide security, safety, uh, when you start really loading, uh, an excess of weight onto your spine and your body, like you need to be able to, you know, react appropriately. And that's so true. Cause yesterday when I squatted, like even after I did I knew I'm like, you know what I need to do is I need to go do more ab work and I need to do more work where I have control of my pelvis at the very bottom of the squat because I know that when I hit the bottom of the squat, when I have a heavy load on me, there is a split second. I mean, it is very small, but a very split second where I relax my core and I'm not stabilizing my whole hip complex Mm -hmm. and I just am thinking about getting out of the hole. And that split second is enough to potentially injure me or Mm -hmm. for me to even feel it that I'm feeling it in the wrong areas. And if I would have a really stable core, Mm -hmm. naturally that wouldn't happen. And there's a, there's a tech, by the way, there's a technique to using a weight belt. So it's like you put it on and boom, I'm stronger. No, you actually have to to learn how to use it. You have to learn how to put it on. It's funny. Whenever I would train with people and they'd want to use a weight belt, like they didn't, they, they couldn't even put it on tight enough. They didn't have the technique and it felt uncomfortable. So there's definitely a skill and, and there's a lot of skill involved with learning how to use a weight belt. But one thing you understand is this, if you get really, really good at lifting with a belt, then that's where a lot of your strength lies, is in wearing the belt. Once you take the belt off, you may be surprised at how uh, not strong you feel when you have when you take the belt. That happened to me years ago. I remember I, I was doing lots of heavy deadlifts, and so I was wearing the belt every single time I deadlifted. Anything over 300 pounds, put the belt on. And I got my deadlift up to like 530 or 535, something like that, which is a decent weight. And then I went to visit my cousin up in Sacramento, forgot my weight belt. 
So, and we were supposed to work out the next day. And I'm like, ah, fuck, whatever. I don't have my weight belt. I'm just going to work out without one. And I put five plates on the bar, 495. So here's, I'm a guy who was pulling 535 with a belt. I pulled 500 and I grinded that motherfucker up without a belt on. And I was sore as shit up and down my low back. And then I realized like, wow, that, that belt adds like a good 30 pounds mm -hmm. to my deadlift. And so, you know, is it worth it? I don't know. I mean, I like the, the, I love, I enjoy the art of lifting weights. I do it for the sake of doing it. I don't necessarily do it for the sake of, you know, being a, a stronger person in the real world, although I enjoy that as well. I actually just do it because I enjoy doing it. So that's what the belt is for me. But I cannot disagree at all with what Justin says. In fact, the right answer is what Justin says, which is if you're listening to this podcast and you just want to build a strong body and you want to look good, should you ever get a weightlifting belt? Probably not. It's probably you're going you're gonna to learn different recruitment patterns. You're going to get good at different. There's no need for it. Just get really good at being able to do it without a belt. Get the mobility, get the stability that your body can provide without it. Now, if you're a gym rat and you're really into the gym and you want to try different things, I totally get it. I do the same it thing. It looks really cool with a stringer tucked into it. <laughs> or a wife beater. Uh, those, are Taylor's pe those are Taylor's people. He loves yeah, to hang he out loves, with them all the time. He loves that. I like to wear my weight belt out in the uh, real world too sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like, now I know I'm strong as I normally am in the gym. Totally. My fanny pack with chalk in it. Oh my God. Okay, next one. Corey Samodowski. I hope I said your name right. I constantly feel hungry all the time. I feel like after I eat a full meal, I feel like I can always eat more, even though I know I'd be in a surplus. Not sure if there's anything I can do to help this problem or not. I'm a new member of the forum, and I'm not sure if this is something I can ask in there or not. You can ask anything <laughs> yeah. You can in ask there. anything in the forum. Literally, <laughs> literally Except anything. let's ask millions you know, <laughs> yeah. to listen. Yeah. You know, um, so a couple things. First, you know you'd be in a surplus, so that's an interesting uh, statement. If you're somebody who you're, you're, you are overweight, you're 20 pounds overweight, 30 pounds overweight, and you find that you never feel satisfied with the food that you're eating, there's a couple ways I would look at it. One is there's some emotional stuff that's going on here with food. And many times what we think is hunger is just cravings. And cravings are motivated not by the actual hunger signals, but rather that by our emotional state context, like the environment I'm in or the people I'm around. Um, or, you know, there's lots of different things. Am I stressed out? Am I anxious? Am I bored? Well, I mean, she could be... Um, I find this, too, with uh, macro profiles that are fucked up. So I would love to see what mm -hmm. your macro breakdown looks like because I've helped out many people in the same situation, and it was because they're, they're subscribing to the low-fat diet where they're eating... 10, 10 to 20 grams, maybe 30 grams of fat all day long, and it's a high carbohydrate diet. And so every time they eat carbohydrates, that spikes blood sugar and they get hungrier again because of carbs. They feel like they can't get enough ever to fill them all the way up. And they're eating so low fat that when I take that and I flip it on its head, I drop their carbohydrates, I increase their fats by like double. Yeah. They tend to be satiated more and they don't feel like they they have to keep trying to refill the tank. And and that's the other thing I was going to say is like the kind of food that you're eating, like Adam was saying with macros. And also the, here's, here's the thing. If you're eating a lot of processed foods, your hunger and satiety signals are all fucking out of whack. That's just the bottom line. Remember, mm -hmm. remember this. Highly processed foods are engineered to make you want to eat more. They're engineered to override they cravings. Yeah, they override your your natural natural systems of satiety. Like, if I sit down in front of a bowl of, you know, whole natural foods, I'm less likely to overeat than if I ate sat in front of a, a bowl of highly processed foods. We can use potatoes as an example. Get a bunch of plain white, no salt, no butter, boiled baked potato or boiled potatoes. Eat as many as you can in 15 minutes and then try that again with a bunch of fried potato chips with salt on them and see which one you you overeat on. I also want to point out that if you are just now getting the forum and I don't know if that means you potentially am following one of the MAPS programs too, that, and this is common, I just, I'm coaching a girlfriend of mine as a favor and one of the things that I had to tell her is like when we first started off is if you're hungry, I actually want you fed. I know that you haven't been training, lifting weights for the last three months plus. I know that I'm handling your programming. I know what you're doing lifting wise. And I know what you're doing, what types of foods that you're choosing because I'm, I'm overseeing all that. And if you're hungry, I want you fed. Because I know that if you're making these food choices that I think are all nutrient dense foods that I want you to be eating and you're still hungry, that's probably your metabolism starting to kick up because you're weightlifting. 
So that could be very much and you're so. you're talking about the right foods. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If I'm overseeing the diet, so I know the types of foods that she's choosing, I'm completely fine with, oh, you want another serving of steak? Go for it. Have another four ounces if you're still hungry. Oh, you want you want another two cups in your greens and salads or another tablespoon of coconut oil in there? Like, absolutely do it. Like, I want you fed. If you feel hungry like that, where you're, that could be your body's metabolism saying, hey, mm-hmm. we are stimulating, we are lifting, and we're trying to build muscle. We need more nutrients, and I don't want you to deprive yourself. I want you fed. So there's a lot of things that could be going on yeah, with Yeah, because what's funny a lot of times is people will, will feel this, and they don't reach for the whole natural mm-hmm. type of foods. They'll be like, oh, my God, I'm so hungry. Yeah. And so, And I do this with my kids, by the way. My kids will eat dinner. And then they'll be like, oh, I'm still so hungry. And I'll be like, cool, we have more chicken in the fridge or we have more broccoli. I want chips. Yeah, and they'll be like, no, I don't want that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Right, steak, chicken thighs, salmon, go to town. You're not hungry. You're still still hungry. You're still hungry. Like, go have some more. Eat some more of that for sure. I want to see because in my experience, I never, unless I was training a competitor who has already been brainwashed to think they need four scoops of protein every day, I never have had a female that is grossly overconsuming proteins and fats. They, they, I don't just don't get it. I get carbohydrates. I get people that mm-hmm. are over consuming carbohydrates, processed foods, things like that. And if that is not you and what Sal is saying isn't clicking with you, then the other thing could very much so possibly be that you're following a new MAPS program. You're following a training program. Your body's being stimulated. It needs more nutrients to build more muscle. Feed that motherfucker. Give it some. Give it some more nutrients. If mm-hmm. someone has switched over and they're eating nutrient dense foods, though, so it's not an issue of their hunger signals being out of whack because they're eating processed right. food. Mm-hmm. Then, so you're eating all these whole foods and you're still feeling this way. It could be something else going on. So, well, first of all, I want to. I would want to know how much water they're drinking good and question. make make Very sure that point. they drink enough water because a lot of people think that they're hungry all the time and they're really just thirsty. Um, so if you're getting enough water. I mean, I would go back to what you're saying about the macros. If our body is too low in any macro for too long a time, it's starving for that. And it's, you're not going to feel hungry until it gets that. And same with any vitamin or mineral. And I see this a lot with salt. Like people have become really afraid of salt because they're thinking of processed like table salt. But we're talking about like high quality right. Himalayan pink Huge salt or sea salt. Yeah. yeah. Like people, you'll be hungry all the time until you put some salt on your food. Like your mm-hmm. body needs that. And same with magnesium, right. which is why supplementing with magnesium help so many people or like you're craving chocolate your body probably wants magnesium right. mm-hmm. so anytime you're too low in something like your body's going to feel hungry until you give it that yeah if everything is really well rounded and you're eating whole nutrient dense foods and you're still having issues then that's when i would look to something deeper like gut dysbiosis right. parasite candida mm-hmm. overgrowth something else um and I would look into your gut health because like that is really common or even low stomach acid. Like when you have really low stomach acid, you're not digesting your food. If you're not digesting your food, your body isn't absorbing it. Right. right? right. So looking at those those deeper issues. This which, is why yeah. no matter who I'm coaching for, what their goals are, whatever they're doing, what I always ask for is don't change a thing. Document everything, put mm-hmm. it in your fat secret for a single week. So not only can I see it, but you can see it yourself and you can take a look. And most people, especially if you're a mind pump listener, are smart enough to kind of go back and look at that and go like, oh shit. Like, I mean, this was, I just had someone do it and they're like, wow, Adam, I didn't realize how much sugar I was eating. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, yeah, it's crazy how easy it is to get sugar. And then you you think that your fruit snack is such a great snack that you have late at night. And it's like, and then you think, oh, well, I only had one little package of M&Ms, but you were already over your daily sugar intake that you even need by fucking noon. Mm-hmm. And then you finish the night off on that and you think you're being really modest by only having you know a bowl of fruit and one little thing of M&Ms. But it's like, you have no idea what you're setting yourself up for. That. And then on top of that, you're not even moving that much or training that hard. Yeah, people yeah. need to understand a few things. Like the We evolved to have these, these, these natural signals that tell us when to sleep, when to wake up, when to drink water, when to eat food, and when not to eat food. But they all, and they're very accurate. They're actually very, in a healthy individual, if you're a healthy person, those are pretty accurate signals. The problem is they involved in an environment that's so different from the one Mm -hmm. that we live in. So we live in an environment with electric sunlight all the time. So our sleep gets all thrown off. Uh, We're, you know, in an environment with extremely accessible, highly palatable foods with flavors that are combined in textures and tastes and colors that would never exist in nature. So now all of a sudden we can't trust any of those things. But if you go back and you stick to the things that we evolved eating and just kind of focus on that, what will start to happen slowly is your signals will start to become more accurate and you'll find that you won't overeat. You'll find that you'll eat when you're hungry and you'll eat enough 
and you won't overstuff yourself. You'll start to find that those signals are actually quite powerful. And I'll tell you this right now, try to ignore your signals or override them yourself for as long as you want. Eventually, they're going to win. So really, the key to long-term success is to get in touch with those signals, understand them, and then be able to listen to them because it's easy to eat right when you want to. That's the key. Also goes back to like, like lifestyle factors like sleep and stress if you if you are not sleeping enough you will be hungry all the time i see this Mm -hmm. all the time so people who aren't getting enough sleep i would get that in check yeah and that happens because it's a it's a form of stress Mm -hmm. and your body is literally thinking we need to consume and store calories because this person is overcome this is lacking sleep for some particular reason maybe a a famine is coming up or whatever and so you're just going to consume more food plus you're just awake more of the hours Mm mm-hmm All right. Logan Roadman. How do you tell your girlfriend she's fat without being a dick? (laughs) This is like the age old question. What a great thing to have you here for so you could tell us if that would work or not. I can't wait to hear you. Yes. Oh, man. Oh, jeez. So that's a tough (laughs) pinch test. You go by and do like a random pinch. (laughs) That's a tough one for guys and girls. Like, how do you tell your girlfriend? Well, what I'm trying to do for this person, because it's there's probably a good chance that I've had a conversation around this at one point, and I'm trying to think <laughs> how, that, how that went out as I share, share the story. So uh, I think uh, clever, and I'm not saying by any means this is the way. This is, I think, what has worked for me, right? Um, if I think that my my girlfriend is getting fat, and I love her and her personality, everything about her, but I'm concerned that, like, I don't know if I really would be okay if she put on a hundred pounds. Like anyone, how often do any of us ask that? Do you ever ask like, what if my partner did put on now Katrina and I've had this conversation. This is again, being older or wiser. Like we've talked about it. Like we've made a contract. Like, listen, if you get fat, you have an out hundred percent. Each of us, like we can love each other, kids, everything like that. You put on a hundred pounds. Like that's my, that's my thing. So you're, and the way we say it is this, it's like, that is you telling me you're checked out of this relationship. Yeah, it has nothing to do with you. Right. It has a little bit to do with how you look, but it's right. really just you, yeah, you fucked because it you're not loving yourself. Yeah, and that and you have to first love yourself before you love me. Therefore, you showing me that is a reflection mm-hmm. of you not love. And then this relationship won't work, and so we're just going to agree that we need to move on or separate so you can work on yourself. So we've had that conversation. Now backing to a relationship where maybe I've seen a girl starting to creep up on weight, and like, okay, how do I say this without sounding like a dick? Because I think I bring that conversation up without telling her she's fat. Like, for example, an opportunity will present itself when maybe you see a couple that is overweight a lot. If you live in California, it'd be really easy to find this couple. Or maybe even a couple that is in incredible shape. Just go to a theme park. Or, <laughs> That's what you got to do. Or you, everywhere. Or you see a couple who's in... You don't have to point out the negative one. You could do a positive angle too. Like maybe you see a couple that's in incredible shape, but that's a, an opportunity for maybe you to compliment. Like, wow, look at how fit and healthy they are. Like, hun, would you ever want to be that couple who's like keeps in really good shape year round, like and start that conversation and see where she, oh. wh- how she feels about it. And then yeah. I can then. She's like, why are you trying to say I'm not fit right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> read right through that. I shit. can already see it. Oh, it's so oh not if you do it right. Not yeah. if you wait for an, if now if you out of nowhere, we're sitting here, we're, wa- we're at home watching look. Billions, our favorite show. And I all of a sudden bring up out of the blue, like, hey, honey, you know, what do you think about fat people? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like that's not going to work. I mean, it needs to be, it needs to be authentic where something would stimulate that conversation if you're going to be if you're going to be a ninja about this and not offend her right away is when the opportunity arises i would present the question as a you know what do you think about it or you know what would you think if i put on 100 pounds you know what would you that's a a, instead of about her ask her about you like what if i put on 100 pounds of, of body fat what would you think about me or would we still be together that will stimulate the conversation from there I can then express how I feel about this and uh, as if it's an important value to me and why. So you better wrap your brain around that first. So you need to be able to articulate why it's important to you before you just point out that well, she's I'll, fat. I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a, a, like a flip example. Like With your two relationships? You may, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, not, not in a personal <laughs> example. Oh, okay. not, I'm not going there. Let's say, you know, let's say you're a guy and you're successful and you, you've got a lot of money, you've got a nice house, nice car, and you're dating a girl. And you ask her, hey, would you still be with me if I was broke? You know, many women would still be with you if they saw that you were still ambitious and hardworking and you had, you were still with that drive. If you became this lazy degenerate who just lost their zest for life and then you lost your money, there's a, there's a big difference there. And this is the same thing with being overweight. Like if you're with a woman and she gets pregnant and gains a bunch of weight, 
Very different than if That's she your just. Fault, then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> very different. At least about thirty pounds. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very different than her just being like, I don't even care anymore about myself. I'm just going to eat whatever I want and. And so I think that's the conversation. I honestly think honesty is the best thing. I just would be gentle. I wouldn't say things like, "Yeah, that was hey, my, honey, I don't that's find my you way of gently yeah. getting into the conversation yeah. where I can be real, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's, <laughs> let's find a situation, whether it be watching a show or we saw a couple that looks this way, whether it be ripped or overweight, that's a great time for it. It's, it's going to probably naturally pop in your head when you see it anyways and then express it, say it, you know, oh, well, honey, what do you think of that? And then get it going and talking, but you better have your brain wrapped around why that's important to you because I think that's where guys fuck up is they say in their head like, I don't want a fat chick, yeah. but then they're like, well, <laughs> they've never asked himself, well, why don't I want a fat chick? Or what does that mean to me? You know, and how do I articulate that to a fat chick and not piss her to off? <laughs> okay, can, oh I, can I answer this? My friend actually just asked me this like a few weeks ago about his girlfriend. Oh, really? She to like she's still in college and he's like she's put on so much weight and I don't know what to say and I told him I well to focus on the other aspects of so what would what does she need to do she needs to start getting off her ass and exercising she needs to stop drinking so much she needs to start eating better right and I was like you need to focus on those not the weight so just and talk about like the mental benefits part of this is because she's mm. like kind of depressed at college like you know just figuring out her life and mm. I'm like talk to her about why she's feeling that way and say, you know, when I started working out regularly and eating this way, like my mood totally changed. I have so much more energy. And then like, you but ha- you have so much more time than me though. I've got so much more stress and I've got to worry well, about my job. And well, my, you see, know, that's what I, I'm well, always so trying to find out, I told him only hang out with her if you're going to do something active. Mm-hmm. So we're going to hang out if we go on a hike. We're going to hang out if we go to the gym together. We're going to go out. We're going to have dinner tonight and I'm going to cook. And right. it's going to be something healthy. Right. You know what I mean? And like forcing it that way. <laughs> hey, babe, I cooked asparagus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah, we're we're having water tonight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a fasting dinner. Oh it's, a new it's, a new it's cool. It's yeah, ice cubes. Really, really overhauling. <laughs> it's really, really good. I mean, My point is don't focus on you're, get, you're getting fat. Focus I mean, this on was, everything else. Well, it's this a good, was a real conversation mm-hmm. that Kat- Katrina and I have 100% had this yeah. conversation. Like, I can call my wife fat and you know, she's okay with it. And she calls me fat. It's just our relationship. Well, it depends on the I relationship. Like yeah. Not yeah. some people are like, sensitive. Hey, you're looking a little, uh, little tough. I mean, we. You know? she, I, she says that to me. I'll the, say it to her. I, <laughs> I relate it to. It's great. That's so I, I awesome. relate it to a reflection of what's going on inside of me. I really believe that our our. That was so deep. I, I mean, it, <laughs> is it not though? I mean, let's think of think about all of us, our own personal experience. Let's forget everybody else. Our own personal experiences, each of us individually. The times when your body was physically out of shape the most. So think of your worst time that you were physically and ask or ask yourself and tell me where where were you where was your mental space at that time? Horrible. Right. And so and just like you're saying, connect that. Well, mm-hmm. I'm I don't I don't it's not my job to connect your happiness and you loving you. And I'm not and it's not my job as a partner. Like I don't believe in a relationship like that. This is you you have your journey and your experiences and I have mine. I just happen to have chose to share this together, therefore we're in a partnership. But it's not my responsibility to to love you. That's you. You gotta love yourself first. Mm-hmm. And if you're not loving yourself and your body is reflecting that. That's that's on you to fix. And if you don't want to fix that and you don't love yourself enough, I can't possibly love you enough to fix that. So therefore, we're gonna we're gonna bounce. I would I would a hundred percent focus on the not loving yourself and not focus anything on the weight. Yeah. At all. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say yeah. anything about being fat or being overweight. It would all of it would be like, look, I've noticed that you're you you seem to be more depressed or not as happy. You you've lost some zest, you're not as active as you were before, you're not doing the things you enjoy. I noticed that you're eating foods that seem to be comfort foods and I feel like maybe you're anxious or like what's going on let's talk about this because I want you to love yourself because it makes it easier to love you when you when you love yourself Mm -hmm. and take it from that standpoint because when you make it look look, if if this person's gaining weight they probably aren't feeling good about themselves there's probably some stress or anxiety or depression going on and telling them that they're fat and that they need to lose weight because you don't want to be with them because they're getting too fat is only going to make it worse it's only you know how many clients I've trained, women who were post-divorce and they'd come hire me as a trainer and then we became close friends and they told me one of the problems that their husbands always had with them was that they were overweight and then they got divorced and guess what they did after they got divorced? 
got fit and lost weight. Yeah. Not during the marriage because yeah. it only made them feel worse. Right. Yeah. When their husband was telling them that they're fat, all they would do is they'd want to eat worse and they'd want to move less and just feel more depressed. Right. So focus on that. Focus on the, yeah, you get, know, get take care of yourself. Of, uh, get to the root of the issue, obviously. And that's one of the, it, yeah, it, it, if you can kind of like identify that in ways that you can sort of contribute as far as like providing, um, you know, like less responsibilities or, or things in within her schedule. to Beautiful. Kind of prom- That's exactly what I was just going to yeah. say right now was promote if you're a time. Stud, if you're a real stud, you'll find something in her day and you'll alleviate that for her. Yeah. You'll t- if she handles the dishes or she does the laundry or she's the one who whatever d- runs the grocery shopping or it's something that what is- if she takes that time and goes and eats court or <laughs> <laughs> that's when you got to say fat <laughs> no, no, no. because because normally what will happen w- when somebody gets in this place where they're putting on weight and they're a lot of times not always but a lot of times they don't think they have the time i mean how many clients have we mm-hmm. had in front Biggest of us excuse right is i don't have the time so even if she you point that out you may just end up making her cry and get upset because she feels like she doesn't have the time to even accomplish that and now you think she's fat and now you just added more to her stress that she already had so maybe alleviate some of that stress by handling maybe a task or a job that she does to free her up for time for herself and maybe you help her you lead her in that direction to find the things that will help her love herself more whether that be reading growing walking spending time with the things that she loves maybe that's going with her friends and doing something but you know make that a, a priority and maybe help her and her sister if you really care and love about this yeah. throw away all the doritos yeah I, I i had this one this one client once who she would complain about her husband and he was really overweight it was like a good 60 pounds overweight and she would talk about his health like honey i want you to be healthy you know we have kids together this and that so this guy goes and gets a physical from the doctor and they do a bunch of blood tests and everything came back normal. Like cholesterol was normal, blood. So he's like, oh, see, babe, I don't need to work out. I'm perfectly healthy. Oh, terrible. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Like, what do you say at that point? You know what I mean? <laughs> terrible, terrible discussion. It, why did, okay, it bothers me because a lot of women let themselves go once they get into a relationship because they feel like they don't have to try anymore and they're mm-hmm. not prioritizing it. And I think it goes back to the deeper issue of like not loving themselves and sure. caring about, but I feel like it should be the opposite. Like, when you're in a relationship, why are you not motivated to take care of yourself more for that other person? Right. You know. I think because you start to maybe because you you're start complacent. to feel yeah you start yeah. to feel secure and you know and, and, and you again complacent you stop doing the things that got you the partner in the first place you stop doing them to keep it so and to keep the person which is a big mistake a lot of people yeah, make. You stop loving yourself, man. Definitely. That's, you stop loving yourself, you start focusing on all the other things. You know, Get That's back to, to taking care of you. Check this out. If you aren't subscribed to our YouTube channel, you're probably a loser. So get on YouTube right now. Subscribe to Mind Pump TV. We post the best... If we didn't just offend you. We post the best videos on YouTube voted five years in a row by us truly. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.